Hello, hello, and welcome to the All In Podcast with Nate Payo. Of course, I am your host, Nate Payo. Today, I'm go- joined with guest Gabriel Peterson. Gabe is a full-time real estate investor, two-time podcaster at the Real Estate Investing Club podcast and the Pursuing Greatness podcast. Like many entrepreneurs, Gabe tried and failed at many different business models before finally setting on real estate after his first flip in 2014. Since that flip, Gabe has been investing in multifamily, mobile home, and RV parks, and eventually started a podcast specifically for new and growing investors called the Real Estate Investing Club. He loves podcasting so much that he started a second podcast on living a great life called Pursuing Greatness, and now runs both his podcasts and real estate businesses out of his home in sunny Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you uh, for having me. Glad to be here. You know, I'm glad you're here too, but do really, do really people think Seattle is sunny or is that yeah, kind that, of a That was supposed cheap? to be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Seattle is the opposite of sunny. Yeah. It's uh known for its rain, right? <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah, welcome to the show. Um, I'm real curious, like you talked about, uh, trying businesses and failing and uh, before you finally settled on real estate what were some of the businesses you you tried before and what led to their failures yeah yeah for sure i actually um i somebody just invited me to be on their podcast that was all about failing just the failures of your life and it was really interesting i got to go through all of them so i'm primed i know the story now i, <laughs> I already rehashed old, it. old wounds picking at the scabs right <laughs> yep um, but yeah, so failures. So, um, when I graduated from college, I got started in, as in management consulting and I did that for like six years. I didn't like a second of it. Like I was, I, I liked my team. I hated the commute. I just did not like the job. Um, and so I had always been trying to like figure a way out of that. And so I was that guy that was like scrolling through Facebook and that ad popped in front of them and said, you know, start an e-commerce store and you'll make a million dollars. And so I jumped on that. I, uh, my first failed business, I actually ended up starting six e-commerce stores, but my first one was a white label candle store called El Fuego Candles. Um, and I found the wholesaler. I made, uh, I made the, all the branding material, made the website, all that stuff. I got a few sales. Um, but the problem that I didn't foresee is uh, the weight of the candles increased the um, the shipping cost so much that the margin was essentially zero when you included the advertising spend. And so I did that. I got a few sales and I started to ramp it up just a little bit, but then I realized that I was making like two cents per, per sale. And so it just didn't make sense. So I closed that one. Um, and then I went on to a few other uh, e-commerce stores the next one was um, print on, or uh, drop shipping. Uh, if you're familiar with drop shipping, you basically find a product, um, find a product out you know in the internet somewhere like AliExpress, etc. You put it on your website for a little bit more than what you found it for, drive pr- uh, traffic to the pro- um, to the website, and then make the sale. You get the you know the slim margin there. Um, usually, it's like five percent or something like that. Um, that was good, but it. I wasn't able to scale it very much specifically because, because the products that I was choosing were, were pretty low quality. Um, so I stopped that and then I moved on to another one, which is print on demand. Um, basically you get, you create designs and then you put it on a shirt um, and you, you do the advertising, the marketing, get people to buy the shirt. And then the company that I, I connected with, um, they'll print it, ship it to the customer. And I'm j- basically just doing the marketing and the design. Turns out I'm not a good designer. I, I don't have that eye. So <laughs> <laughs> my, my shirts did not sell that well. Um, there was another store in between that, but the final one actually did work. I got it to about 20 to 30,000 a month. Um, again, it was a, dro- a drop shipping store on Amazon, but the margins were super slim and it was just, it was just like too much work for what I was getting. Um, and so I ended up stopping that and that, that, you know, that batch of failures is what I considered my first failure. And failure is kind of like a word that I don't like to use because I did learn a lot, especially in the marketing space um, in there. And so, but that was the first, you know, false start that I got. From there, I went on, you know, I still was desperate, not desperate, but really, really wanted to get out of corporate. 
And so I, you know, again, looking through my Facebook feed, you know, scrolling through, scrolling through, um, uh, ad pops up. It was a guy who was, uh, who was selling agency, the agency model. And he was like, Hey, you can make a million dollars if you start a marketing agency, super easy. You don't need anything. Um, and since I had just done the e-commerce stores, I had, you know, I had really honed in my marketing chops. There was, there was a lot of BDC, you know, Facebook ads, uh, Google ads that I was running to sell these products. And so I was pretty good. Um, and so this, you know, I saw this ad and I was like, that makes a lot of sense. I, I can do that. That's something that will, you know, I have the skills for, um, and I can really run with it. And so I switched, pivoted, started a digital marketing agency, agency, quote unquote, it was uh, freelancing really. Uh, I didn't hire somebody at that point. Uh, but I got a client, uh, it was, it was in real estate, luxury, real estate, um, realtor broker, uh, over on the East coast. And I started working with him, um, selling, it was crazy. We were selling like 10, $20 million houses, uh, with Facebook ads and it was actually working, but, um, I got to the point Well, he got to the point where he needed to scale. And I wasn't at that point. I couldn't, I didn't have. I was working the entire time. Well, I made two big mistakes with this, this endeavor. Um, the first one was pricing. I, I wasn't confident in myself enough to the point where I could charge what I needed to charge in order to make it a real business for me. Um, you know, with him, with the, you know, the first clients that I was getting, I would tell them $750 a month. And that's just in my mind. I was like, okay, that, that makes sense. You know, I really want them to be my clients. And so I'm going to charge them something that, you know, anybody can pay. And so I charge 750. That is, that's the wrong strategy. When you, when you go into business, you need to be confident in your product and yourself and you need to price yourself accordingly. I should have charged um, at least 5,000 a month. So I was charging 750 and I was getting, I was putting all this effort into it. And every single day I would go to the computer, start working on his campaigns. And I'd be like, man, I'm getting nothing for this. It's like $750. And it's just kind of crushed me. And, uh, eventually it got to the point where he needed the scale. He, he needed more campaigns. Um, I needed more money because I was only making 750 at this point. I had actually left my corporate job. Um, and so that, so now I was looking, you know, I need to make money. And so I got to the point where I was like, man, I can't do this. This is, this is not for me. And so I backed out of that one. I, I called that a, a failure, a false start. Um, and at this point I was starting to do real estate. I was, had, I had already done my first flip, uh, with a friend of mine, I'd already gotten the bug. I knew it worked. It all made sense to me. Uh, and so my final flip was to real estate. And since then I've just, you know, gung ho and all in, as you say, <laughs> what's well, funny. You, um, you talk about the, those false fa failures as false starts. Right. Yeah. But, but two of them, uh, stand out as very relatable to me. And I think a lot of people have done the same thing. So like I've, I've started e-commerce businesses, right. And you think like, Hey, it's, if I get product and I put it on the website, people are going to find it and people are going to buy it. All I got to do is write ads that drive people here and they'll buy it. But once like you figure that out and the cost of all the back end and the overhead and the cost of advertising, a lot of times there's not any money left over right mm -hmm. and you're just competing really on a price point and what i found is the the businesses that do successful like they 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 go from like hey, i'm just a white label brand to a, a real brand that people care about there tends to be some sort of compelling story behind that and they're better at showcasing why they are solving a problem versus you and so i had this um me and my wife were going to do this like women's fitness apparel line and we were, we were going to import some stuff in and we were kind of pushing it out there put and trying to get it to work and i was like hey this this product looks good they had a whole bunch of like marketing and models and stuff like that that was like really um compelling like like i thought like hey these look like really great photos i can't see why people wouldn't want to purchase them and then you kind of start realizing like nobody wants to buy them because they they're, they're not vested in your story they just don't care and then it was just kind of like i got to the point where i was like hey we we're gonna have to invest not a lot of money but it was like kind of like a lot of money it was like five thousand bucks to bring a bunch of product in and i was like are we going to put 5,000 bucks in a me too product? That's just going to kind of like, maybe if we're lucky, bring in 5,500 bucks and like, go, 
to make 500 bucks on 5,000 for that high mid effort, it's just not going to be worth it. And I, and I shut that down and I look back on some of the other business I had and they all seem to have that same uh, problem is that they were just me too brands. They're just like, Hey, I'm just going to put something out there. Like I'm going to start a business. I'm going to start a landscape business. What's your differentiator? Uh, customer service and really great pricing. Like whoop de doo like nobody cares. Like, in, and I've since learned you have to be very niche with who you're marketing to and really dial that down. And you're right. Those failures, they're failures at the moment, but they're learning things that we take, take with us. And then the other thing you talked about was valuing your time and your effort. And I've been in that space too, where you think I do this all the time. Like, what would I pay somebody to, to do something? What does it seem like is the right thing to me? And, you know, so, so you value yourself based on that that dollar value, like, oh, like 60 bucks an hour, a hundred bucks an hour. That's a lot of money. Like how could I charge more than a hundred bucks an hour? But sometimes you have to look at it as the value you're providing. Right. So if you said, Hey, I'm going to charge you 5,000 bucks a month to do this, right. That, that, that to you sound like a ton of money, but if you're bringing in that guy, $5 million a year, a, a month in sales, like that's a pittance. That's this yep. tiny amount. And you go, Hey, if you had to hire me full time to do this for you, you'd be paying me 10,000 bucks a month. So I'm actually giving you a, a steal at five, but instead we're just going, Oh, 750. That seems like a number I would pay. That seems like something that I could afford, but we're sitting there in this small mindset and not realizing the value we're doing. So it's, you know, so important to learn those two lessons and realize your value is it necessarily, I think I saw this on, um, on a, a Facebook post this morning even, and it said, the amount you're paid isn't for the hours you work, it's for the value you provide, right? And so we got to flip that mindset that it's really about the value we provide. So I was going to ask you if you got into real estate, but you already answered this question because you saw another Facebook ad that says, learn how to flip houses. <laughs> to flip houses. <laughs> no, I, I didn't actually. That one I, it was because I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yeah. um, which is like the Bible of real estate. So uh, no, that was the one that I did not go off of a, a Facebook ad for. Maybe that's why I succeeded. I wasn't following Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get off the Facebook, get rich quick scheme ad. So um you know, what's kind of been your experience with uh, flipping real estate? I know you started in 2014. That was kind of, I don't know, about the time the 2008 housing bubble was really starting to pick up steam and come out of it. Um, we've gone strong up until 2019. And then 2020 has been um, a wild ride for, for real estate. I think a lot of people expected things to turn out differently and that hasn't proven to be true maybe even the exact opposite so what's what's been your roller coaster ride since 2014 to today um yeah i mean so one of the reasons i liked real estate is because it i uh the effort that i put in i got a decent amount of money back but i mean i'm i, I have 2020 vision looking back I, that was not, it was not all me. I was doing a good job, but like what, what I was doing, I was doing things right. And I was, I was doing things correctly. So I should have made money, but the money that I was getting in return for my effort was bolstered by that. You know, it's an upswing, um, real mm -hmm. estate. It goes on cycles. Uh, if you go in a, during an upswing, especially during this major upswing that we've had, I think, um, I've heard economists say that it's the, the largest, uh, you know, expansion period in the real estate market in history. Um, we've never seen something, you know, appreciate for so long. So I was kind of helped out, um, with that. And that, that is one of the reasons like it really drew me in. Um, dang it. I was talking and I lost track of the, the initial question that you asked. Can you, can you say that again? <laughs> I was just kind of talking about like the, the wild ride from 14 to 2020. Um, oh, yeah. kind of your experiences with, you know, how, how you've, let's just maybe dive into how you've evolved since your first flip to where you're at today and yeah yeah for sure and that that's been that that, that has been quite a ride um i mean obviously whenever the longer you that i stay in something and this is one of the other lessons that i've learned um you got to choose something and just stick with it. I mean, it doesn't matter. Just don't change paths. That's, that's what will make you successful is just 
grab a path and hold on to it and don't change it. Um, I mean, if you really, really hate it, then yeah, change it. But if it fits most of your needs, then just stick with it. So yeah, I started, you know, and um, when I got started, I was doing flips. Um, I only did two like flip flips. To, and when I realized like, okay, flips is not, it's not the way that I want to go. Um, but I, I did want to be in real estate, but it was not through flips. And that's because flipping is, I mean, I think you've done some as well. It is a job. It's like, it's very hands-on. You have to babysit contractors. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, um, especially from the, from the technical perspective. Uh, real estate itself doesn't have to be that technical, but when you're actually flipping the, the house, you need to know how a house works. <laughs> and I'm talking like structure and things that, you know, when I did my first two, I just didn't realize, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so getting into them, um, that was a big lesson was that flips was not the way that I wanted to do real estate. Um, it's when I first got into it, it's the way that I thought I wanted to do it because that's what I saw on TV. That's what I knew about it was, you know, HGTV, you know, flip the house, yada, yada. Um, so I did two of them. We actually made, you know, a decent amount of money. It was uh, 95 on the first one and then like 60, some, 63 or something on the second. So it was good. It was good return, um, but it wasn't for me. And so that's when we got into wholesales, wholesaling, um, because at this point I'd already had the, the marketing machine created, um, you know, marketing was my strong suit still is my strong suit. And so I'd already created this machine that drew leads to us. Um, so we were still getting people calling us, still getting people, you know, reaching out. And so, um, I knew I didn't want to do flips, but I was still having people calling me. And so the best way to do, to utilize that resource is to wholesale it. Um, for people listening, watching wholesaling is when you, get something under contract. So say I get a house out here in Seattle under contract for a hundred thousand dollars. And then I go and I find my buddy, Joe, who is also an investor who wants that house. And I assign that contract that I just got under, um, that I just, you know, got under contract for 105,000. So got it under contract for a hundred, assigned it for 105. I take that spread of 5,000 bucks. Um, so I started doing that and I liked it. I still do it actually, but it's not, it wasn't like fulfilling what I really liked. I did like owning real estate. I like the structure of real estate. And so I ultimately kind of evolved to the point where I want to, where we're doing um, buy and holds. And so right now we're doing uh, mobile homes and RV parks. We're actually closing on our first mobile home park next week. And we have four under contract um, going out through, we're under contract through the end of October. And so got a lot going on right now, but it's evolved from just doing flips to now, uh, you know, multifamily and mobile home parks. Um, and I mean, there's been a lot of lessons along the way. I'm selling my, uh, one of my multifamily out here in Seattle, just a duplex. And again, example of get real estate on the upswing. I bought this duplex three years ago, um, for $310,000. I did a little work on it. You know, I did, you know, flip it quote unquote, but not not what I, what I would have done with an, with an actual flip. Um, and I didn't even intend on selling it, but somebody came to me and, uh, offered $535,000 just, you know, last week. And I was like, Jesus, I haven't done, I haven't done that much to this property. <laughs> so that's an example of like, when you're, if you want to get into real estate, there's, you can always do it. It always works, but the upswing really helps. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, that, I, that was kind of a wandering, wandering <laughs> response. But. No, I get it. Like, I think a lot of people see the HGTV shows and they show flipping being this like, like fun thing to do. And you create like, Oh, we're taking this ugly house. We're going to make it pretty. And we're going, we're going to, uh, you know, have some, some kooky adventures along the way and then like sell the house. But like people don't realize that like, if you buy a house for 200,000 and you put $60,000 into it and you sell it for 300, and you make 40,000, right? That's what they show you on the, on the, on the TV, but they don't say like, well, you got a 6% commission, right? So take 6% out of 300, like that's 18,000. Now you're down yeah, to holding costs. And then, yep. Oh, by the way, yeah. The holding costs, like it took you three months for the time you bought that house to the time you sold it. So that's three months plus the time you managed it. Plus the cost of the loan during this period of time, you go, Oh, you made 22,000 bucks over three months. That's, you know, that's like, 7,500 bucks a month, like that's not that great 
when you consider your risk involved because you go, oh, well, 7,500 bucks is, is quite a bit of money. But that's like, you know, there's, that's, that's a, you know, there, there's easy ways, not easy ways, but there's alternative ways to do it that don't have as much risk at it. So yep, you go, yep, hey, yep. there's, and then if you have like one little thing go wrong, um, you're, you, you could be very easily upside down, and especially when you add in the cost of your carry. Um, that might be another two or three thousand dollars a month that's not accounted for, and you have opportunity cost of where you could have invested that money just putting it in the stock market. Maybe you could have made uh, a better return or something like that. So, flipping does have its perils, and typically, if things are on the upside, that's when everybody wants to do it because they hear their buddy like, "Hey, I just made forty thousand dollars, bought a house, and resold it." When you're buying on the upswing, it's usually like the last uh, one holding the, it's just trying to find one more sucker that's willing to pay more than you did for it. And real estate really is in in of itself, a very, very boring investment, right? If you think it's like the deals and the chase and the excitement, it's like, no, it's so boring. It's like you go and you find a deal, you look at a ton of deals and you buy one that's undervalued, right? Or it's priced appropriately for the market and you can value add to it. Like a value add would be like, hey, I can buy this $200,000 house. It's three bedrooms. I could add a fourth bedroom. And because I can add the fourth bedroom for uh, $30,000, I could actually charge another 500 bucks a month and, and rent for the month and that over you know, pays for this. And so it's like, okay, I turned a $200,000 investment into a $350,000 investment plus a bigger return on my cash flow and blah, blah, blah. Do the math, hold it for five years. It's, it's a, it's a weird deal. And then you do it and you sit on it. Right. And it doesn't do anything. And you maybe get a call once in a while to go change the toilets or fix a roof or something like that. But it's just kind of boring and you just kind of repeat. And so if you're looking for the high flash deals, it's really, not going to happen. And I think you've, I, you identified it kind of quick. Hey, the, re, the real money is in the long-term holding, right? It's in the, the value appreciation. The um, loan is paid off through the um, rental income. And then, you know, if you're doing it right, you, you know, withdraw more money on the loan and take that and reinvest it in other things. So it's, uh, I think a lot of people do get caught up in the, the flash of it all. Not that you can't make money doing it that way, but you know, there's, yeah, no, yeah, there's guys. Um, I mean, I do a lot of networking up here in Seattle and some of the guys that I, that I talk with, they're doing 20, 30 flips a month. And I, I'm not kidding. That is, that's their actual numbers, but they, I mean, they have a business, they have systems, they have everything is, it's like a, it's a goddamn machine. Like they have mastered this and you can definitely, you can make a, you can make flipping work for you. It is definitely like a viable business model, but you got to, you got to want it. You got to like, that's the thing that you want. You need to want to build a business around flipping. And so, yeah, it's definitely a, it's not for, it's not for everybody to just kind of grab a house and flip for sure. Exactly. So what led you to um, starting a podcast specifically around real estate investing? And then you've also started a second podcast around pursuing greatness. Yeah. So real estate investing was the first one. Um, and that started during COVID. So COVID happened. Um, and I, all of a sudden before that I was, you know, doing, going to a lot of meetups, uh, meeting a lot of brokers, um, you know, doing a lot of face-to-face -face connections with people in real estate. Um, that's how I found, you know, a lot of deals that I wanted to invest in. And then COVID happened and I just had to stay home. And so I was looking for a way to kind of keep networking, keep meeting people, keep kind of expanding my knowledge in real estate. Um, and so I decided to make a podcast and it's been one of the best decisions I've made. It's like, I meet people like yourself who have great experience in real estate. I get to kind of pick their brain um, while also connecting with people who are listening. Um, and so I, I've really taken it like just jumped on board, you know, did the all in thing that you're talking about and really, I'm, I'd like to build this into a real brand, into a real, a real source of knowledge for people for real estate. Um, pursuing greatness, I've always loved self-development, uh, personal development. And I started getting people reaching out to me through uh, the Real Estate Investing Club asking f to, you know, for an interview. Uh, but, you know, I only do investing. That's all, we, that's all we talk about on the Real Estate Investing Club. So 
I decided to start pursuing greatness. Um, at this point, I'm probably going to go down to one per week because two podcasts is too much work unless you have, <laughs> <laughs> unless you have like, you know, a VA or something behind you. Um, and I, I do need to hire a VA, but, um, so yeah, I got them both pursuing greatness is more a passion project. It's more something that I just like doing. I like talking about wisdom and how to live a great life and all that stuff. Uh, real estate investing club is, is, uh, something that I really, I'm really trying to build into, into a real, uh, real brand. Yeah. And I think, um, Derek, gosh, you know, when, when we think about doing a podcast and I was in this boat too, you think of it as a consumer. You're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I had a bunch of people on and we talked about all these great topics and people could listen, right? But then once you start podcasting, this is what I found. It becomes less about what you're doing for other people and more about you just talking to people about the things you're interested in doing. You kind of start doing it a little bit for yourself, right? So the Real Estate Investing Club, you're able to reach out and connect to people in real estate that maybe wouldn't have given you the time of day, right? They're just so busy because they got their own things going on. And let's say, you know, you were getting started and you said, Hey, I want to talk to guys that are flipping 20 to 30 deals a, a month. I want to like pick their brain about their systems. I want to figure out like how they got going. They're not going to take your phone call and talk to you about it. But if you go, <laughs> I got a podcast, you want to come on my podcast, Sure, I'd love to. And you have the opportunity to do that. And the same thing with like pursuing greatness. Like, um, you know, I've reached out to authors of books I found inspiring, right? And said, hey, would you be interested in coming on my podcast? They're like, sure, love to. Guess what? They would have taken my call just to have a phone call about their book and be like, hey, well, I really liked what you wrote on page 28. Like, no, they're not, <laughs> you know, but because Great. you have Keep a reading. podcast, you can connect with people, pick their brains, and you can actually learn right from the source. So I, I'm like this big advocate of people should be podcasting um, just because one, they're going to gain a ton of knowledge. They're going to be connected with people they hadn't otherwise been involved with. So you're going to be able to build your network in a different way possible. And then um, there was another, another, another idea I had behind it, but it just slipped my mind. I don't, what <laughs> was when it? That happens. <laughs> what? Gosh. Oh, well, oh, I know what it was. It is a way to develop leads for your business. And, and oh, I think yeah. this could apply to a lot of different things. But I was, I've been kick, kicking this idea around of like, if you're in sales, right? And you go, why should I have a podcast? Like, I need to be out getting leads. And said, so, what if you had a podcast and you invited the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that you wanted to do business on your show, right? So you bring all these people onto your show, CEOs that are people you want to do business with. And you have a podcast, right? You After the end of the podcast, there's usually a deep brief. Hey, what are you working on? How can I help you? All this stuff. And you say, hey, I'd really like to um, you know, speak with somebody at your company to um, talk about doing work. And I, I have these products. I'd like to get them in front of the right teams, right? You think the CEO goes, hey, we just had a nice podcast. I'll make an introduction. And he calls down and says, hey, purchase an apartment. Um, can you give uh, this guy uh, 15 minutes of your time to hear his pitch, right? And he's just, you know, handing over a favor, like, hey, I'll make an introduction, but, you know, no promises. But guess what? When that purchase agent gets a call from the CEO, the CEO says, take a meeting. There's a little bit of um, maybe over implications of like, hey, I better take this meeting and I better at least give them a real shot at things. And oh, by the way, if they're pretty close, my boss might think it's pretty cool if I hire them. So I think like you could still apply that to, to real estate. You know, if like you were um, doing commercial real estate and you're looking to get connected with brokers or different, you know, companies that rent real estate, like there's just so many opportunities to develop a niche around the people you want to get connected to and hosting a podcast around it. It's just a super, super powerful tool. And um, it does, it is time consuming, but when you get a VA, right? Like it really literally becomes uh, eight o'clock, you got a, a meeting, show up, put your mic on, have a conversation. Just like if we would go grab a coffee or hop on a phone call, Zoom call, hang up. And then the um, VA comes, grabs it, does their little things with it and puts it out. So like, yeah, you're setting up some stuff and there's some legwork you got to do and anything. But once you kind of get the flow going, the podcasting can be very, very fun, very, very good for connecting with people and super, super simple, man. I, yeah. I, I find it very powerful. I'm, 
Yeah, I, I really need to get to that simple stage. Right now, I'm doing all, all the work myself, and you know, it's uh, takes just too much time. <laughs> but does. the the other benefit that I I mean, I every benefit that you said, I totally agree with. Um, the other one is also it kind of lends you credibility. Um, I've noticed, you know, I I before I started the podcast, I was reaching out to brokers via email, um, and you know, I'd get lukewarm responses. But now that I have this signature and it says, check out my podcast, watch my podcast, look at the website, uh, I've noticed people are, are more apt to respond just with the email, just, just by me emailing them, say, hey, looking for uh, you know, a sixplex out in Cincinnati, what do you got? Um, and you know, can you hop on a phone? Now people are like, yeah, let's, let's hop on a phone, let's talk. And I, I'm guessing it's because they actually see the, the podcast and they're like, okay, this guy's credible. Um, and, you know, he's worth my time of day to actually talk to. So your, your credibility is another, another reason to, to start this. And it kind of goes into the, the lead generation that you're talking about. Yeah, it's, I mean, you could get into like the theories behind it, but I think a lot of people um, have this, this, this implied authority, right? And so if, if I know you as the guy from, doing Amazon e-commerce marketing hacks, right? And then you call me up and say, hey, I'm looking to get into real estate. Like, I might think you're kind of, you know, sketchy, like uh, this guy's, you know, has no, no idea what he's doing. But that same person comes to me with Real Estate Investing Club. There's an applied authority that, hey, this guy, I don't know what Real Estate Investing Club is. I don't even know if it's good or not. But I do see that you have like, so automatically our mindsets, our impressions shift and they go, hey, this, this guy's probably pretty legit, knows what he's doing. He's got, um, you know, and, and we talk, I talk a lot about this um, justification of behavior, right? So if, um, a, a realtor is taking your call and he's chasing deals f for you. Right. And he goes and tells his other realtor buddies what he's doing. Like, Oh, I'm chasing deals for some kid that called me out of uh, Seattle and wants to maybe dip his toes in the Cincinnati market. It's realtor. But like, what are you talking about, man? You're stupid. But if you go, Hey, this guy's pretty cool. He's got a podcast. He's doing a bunch of stuff. Like it's a justification for, for their behavior. And then also the other people go, Hey, well, maybe I want to check this out. And so, it, there's there's so much um, truth to that credibility and uh, you know making yourself be become an expert in the field that you're you're representing. So awesome stuff, man. Um, wrapping up, I want to ask you, what does it mean to you to be all in? Yeah, um, I mean, I've mentioned it. I've, I've mentioned your your cash phrase a few times because I really do think that is it's so important to be all in. And what I mean by that is to be committed to be a hundred percent committed to whatever it is you're doing and to focus on that until you get the results that you're actually looking for. Um, you know, I, I've already talked about the e-commerce and digital marketing. Um, one of the big reasons why I didn't, you know, build it to where, to where I had in my mind was I wasn't committed. I wasn't, I wasn't really committed to those paths. Um, digital e-commerce, I was just like, I need to make money this is a good model. Let's go. Um, digital marketing was kind of the same thing, but I already had the skills, but well, for both of them, I wasn't a hundred percent committed. Once I got into real estate and I really did commit, um, I was able to get over the, the humps that you inevitably hit whenever you, you know, you run into, whenever you start a business or any new adventure, you're always going to be running into hiccups. And the first one's always the one that makes you question whether you chose the right path. Um, and if you can just commit, be all in, then you can get through that and it, it will, it, it'll keep you on the same path and drive you to the, to the result that you're actually looking for um, ultimately in the end. Yeah. And, and when you were talking about your, your stories of your failures of the e-commerce, I was actually thinking in my head, and I bet you thought this too, knowing what you know now, you probably gave up too soon in the sense of like, you could have overcome those when you go, Hey, I wasn't making enough money. It's like, well, could you have figured out a way to charge more for the product or find a better product or, you know, adjust your, your, the rates you're charging for your marketing, but that's all, you know, tw hindsight 2020, you mentioned that. Cause I've done the same thing. It's like, yeah, 
knowing what I know now, I could have just done things way different with those businesses that failed. And I probably could have made them into smashing successes, but those are lessons I had to learn. And my, one of the, uh, I'll give you a little bit of pursuing greatness insight. One of my favorite books is this book called The Alchemist. And it's about this kid that's going through journeys in life to find his treasure. And along the way, he has things happen to him um, that lead to lessons that he is able to apply later down the road. And I, I apply a lot of that to like, hey, sometimes we're not ready to hear the message or learn the lesson at the time. But when we're but when we are ready mentally, we're like, oh, it makes so much sense. And it set you up for where you're at now and the avenues you're pursuing. And it all happened for a reason. But I think, too, you, you've, you've looked back and you're going, hey, I, I probably could have overcome those hurdles if I had been more all in. Because what you talked about, that there's other people out there that did the same thing and, and said, you know what, screw it. I'm going to do something a little bit different and stayed in e-commerce and they're crushing it and they're doing good stuff. So whatever it is business-wise, you have to be willing to learn the lessons and then step back and pivot, adjust, reconfigure. And sometimes it is, right? Like, hey, it's, this isn't something I thought. Like I was, For me, I chased a lot of money. I chased a lot of solutions and I wasn't in love with the process. And so like you just lose interest. And like when you come to that, like, hey, I'm not making really a lot of money for the effort. It's part of it too, is you're just like this, this idea was glamorous but it wasn't fulfilling and so it it's just like hey you know i'm i dock and even if it did make sense i'm not going to be happy long term doing it so uh exciting story so tell me a little bit about who your ideal audience is you're looking to get connected with yeah so um i mean i've already talked a bunch about real estate investing club and uh so that is, it is a source of knowledge for anybody who wants to learn how to do real estate investing, wants to learn the different asset classes, the different strategies. Um, we, t we bring on guests, uh, you know, from all different strategies, all different t types of assets, uh, commercial, multifamily, single family. I mean, you name it, um, everybody's on there. So if you want to learn how to do real estate investing, if you want to use that as the, as the model, either for financial freedom or as just as a business, as for an entrepreneurship path. Um, those are the people we're looking for. So if, if you're interested in real estate, if you're interested in, in learning how to do it, um, come check out the real estate investing club um, at the real, the real estate investing club.com. Um, we do three episodes a week and uh, we'd love to love to have you on board. Nate's been on there so you can check out his, uh, his episode. <laughs> awesome stuff, man. So all those links will be listed in the show notes and um, I encourage everybody to reach out, say hi to Gabe, uh, connect with him, listen to his podcast, download it, give it a like, give it a, a review. Um, it's always important to support people that are out there putting out content because sometimes we just don't hear uh, the feedback, even if it's good stuff. And it's always encouraging that what you're doing is making a difference. Um, but if you do reach out to Gabriel and you do have a conversation, let them know you heard about him on the All In podcast with Nate Pale. And thanks a lot for coming on the show, Gabe. Had a great time chatting with you kind of about, uh, you know, restarts, real estate, and just, you know, life, life skills in general. So thanks for coming on. Had a great time chatting with you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nate.